Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Nathan Moore. Uh, I'm a white man, uh, or sorry, a white non-binary person uh, with short brown hair and glasses, um, wearing a black colored shirt. Um, I completed a PhD at Western University, um, and uh, my research interests include neurodiversity, um, autistic identity, epistemic injustice, non-propositional knowledge, epistemic responsibility, and the intersection of epistemic responsibility with moral, social, and political responsibility. Um, I discovered I was autistic during my PhD and was introduced to epistemic injustice shortly after, thereafter. Uh, both discoveries were transformative, but the latter uh, vastly shaped how I think about autistic experiences and neurodiversity. Uh, so our speaker is Amon Dying Katala. Uh, she's an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Quebec, Montreal, where she holds the Canada Research Chair in Epistemic Injustice and Epistemic Agency. Uh, her research interests lie in feminist, social, and political philosophy, as well as philosophy of race and philosophy of disability, and include epistemic injustice and agency, territorial rights, colonialism, indigenous issues, migration, linguistic justice, cultural minorities, and neurodiversity. She's an autistic self-advocate and the co-founder of the Autistic Collective at UCAM, an initiative that aims to bring together and support autistics who study, work, or teach at UCAM. Uh, she's also been an active participant in several events and committees that aim to foster equity, diversity, and inclusion at the institutional, provincial, national, and international levels. Uh, her talk today is titled Epistemic Injustice and Epistemic Agency on Autism. Um, and uh, please remember that closed captioning is available. Um, now I will turn it over to Dr. Katala. Thanks for being here. Great, thank you so much. Um, so my name is Amandine. I'm originally from Belgium and my first language is French. I'm a white autistic woman with long brown hair, brown eyes and round glasses. Behind me is a virtual background that looks like a plain beige wall. I'd like to start by thanking Shelley and Jonathan for organizing this fantastic conference, Jamie for the tech, and Nathan for chairing. I'd also like to thank all fellow speakers and audience members for fascinating presentations and stimulating discussions this week. My talk today is titled Epistemic Injustice and Epistemic Authority on Autism, and it's based on the chapter for the Bloomsbury Guide that Shelley is editing. Because this is a conference on social change and combating social justice, um, sorry, social injustice requires doing so on multiple fronts at once, I'd like to share um, this land acknowledgement. So let me share um, my screen. I acknowledge that UCAM is located on unceded indigenous lands. I recognize the Ganyan Gehaga nation as the custod custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Jojage is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. So to give you a sense of what I'll be talking about today, uh, my abstract is as follows. So autistic people face multiple forms of epistemic injustice in many contexts, whether medical, clinical, familial, social, educational, professional, or academic. Epistemic injustice undermines autistic people's epistemic authority regarding our own experience of ourselves and of the world, which violates the neurodiversity movement's call for nothing about us without us. So my aim in this talk is to identify and argue for criteria that justify epistemic authority on autism and that foster greater epistemic justice for autistic people. In terms of terminology, I just want to um, underline that I'll be using the word neurominoritized instead of neurodivergent and neuronormalized instead of neurotypical. And this is to emphasize that these categories are not natural kinds, but rather the products of neuronormative power relations as emphasized by the neurodiversity movement. <clears throat> 
And I'll also be using identity first language, uh, such as autistic person or autistic, instead of person first language, uh, such as person with autism, um, because identity first language is the preferred language in most of the um, autism self-advocacy, um, and it's also my preferred um, language. Okay, so the outline, we're going to go as follow. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about how neuronormativity creates epistemic injustice for autistics. And um, then I will um, basically introduce uh, the next three points, uh, the distinction between perceived versus actual epistemic authority, the notion of neuronormalized avoidance, perhaps uh, more commonly known as neurotypical ignorance, and the distinction between experiential versus propositional knowledge. And this then will allow us to identify two criteria for epistemic authority on autism, or so I'll argue. So let me start with the first point, how neuronormativity creates epistemic injustice for autistics. And this will require saying just a few words about neuronormativity. So in previous work, um, I, along with some colleagues, have defined neuronormativity as quote, the prevalent neurotypical set of assumptions, norms, and practices that construes neurotypicality as the sole acceptable or superior mode of cognition, and that stigmatizes attitudes, behaviors, or actions that reflect neuroatypical modes of cognition as deviant or inferior. And then, quote, neuronormative assumptions, norms, and practices uphold standards regarding, for example, what is neurotypically considered appropriate eye contact, facial expressions, prosody, conversational flow, processing, and responsiveness, all of which can be difficult for autistic individuals to understand, sense, or apply due to neurocognitive differences, end quote. So neuronormativity is reflected in the very language that we use about autism. So um, we have lots of words in everyday language like epidemic, disorder, de deficit, lack, abnormalities, impairment, risk, cure, treatment, victim, burden, affected by autism and suffer from autism. Neuronormativity also includes common stereotypes and beliefs about autistics, such as that we lack social motivation, empathy, or humor. Neuronormativity also upholds pedagogical and academic standards that do not take into account or different ways of processing information, sensory stimuli, and social interactions in a world built by and for neuronormalized individuals to the detriment of neuro-minoritized people. And neuronormativity is also present in philosophical debates, um, such as when uh, you hear claims like it's not unjust not to be taken seriously if you do not look uh, your interlocutor in the eyes or if you appear too nervous or anxious when uh, you're expressing yourself. So I want to claim that the foregoing um, suggests that neuronormativity creates epistemic injustice for autistics. So let me say now a little bit more about epistemic injustice. Very generally speaking, we can see that a person suffers epistemic injustice if she's either not adequately believed or consulted, in which case she faces an undue credibility deficit, or if she's not adequately understood or represented, in which case she faces an undue intelligibility deficit, because she belongs to a non-dominant social group and more specifically due to certain types of biases that affect these groups. So Fricker famously identified two main types of epistemic injustice, testimonial injustice, which corresponds to an undue credibility deficit and hermeneutical injustice, which corresponds to an undue intelligibility deficit. So let me give some more examples. Um, so testimonial injustice is an undue credibility deficit because of conscious or unconscious biases on the part of uh, one's interlocutors. So for example, if a teacher dismisses the contributions of an autistic student because the student avoids eye contact, appears nervous, or takes a moment to process and respond, the student thereby suffers testimonial injustice because the diminished level of credibility that they receive from their teacher stems from neuronormative biases on the part of their teacher. And I think it's interesting to note that this credibility deficit can occur regardless of whether the teacher knows that the student is autistic, because their diminished credibility judgment still relies on neuronormative biases regarding what is neuronormatively taken to be an appropriate way to interact or react in an epistemic exchange. <clears throat> 
Turning now to hermeneutical injustice, the second type of um, epistemic injustice, um, it's an undue intelligibility deficit because of biases in a society's mainstream pool of interpretive or hermeneutical resources, such as common concepts, shared understandings, social meanings, and collective representations. Because non-dominant groups are often marginalized in the processes that shape mainstream hermeneutical resources, these resources tend to be largely shaped by dominant groups. And as a result of the hermeneutical marginalization of non-dominant groups, mainstream hermeneutical resources tend to obscure, minimize, or stigmatize the experiences, perspectives, and realities of non-dominant groups, which therefore remain largely misunderstood or misrepresented. So for example, the common understanding of autism as a disorder or a set of deficits unduly stigmatizes autis autistics by representing us as deficient, which obscures both that autism is a natural variation among the range of neurocognitive profiles that make up neurodiversity, and that the pathologization of autism is the result of neuronormativity. By marginalizing the neurodiversity model of autism that autistic self-advocates promote, the dominant deficit model of autism misrepresents the reality of autism, which therefore remains largely misunderstood as a disorder. So autistics suffer hermeneutical injustice because the lack of intelligibility that they face stems from neuronormative biases in mainstream hermeneutical resources. So um, autistics face several forms of um, epistemic injustice in multiple spheres, as we've just seen. Um, and in this context, the neurodiversity movement's injunction to say or do nothing about us without us is effectively a call to reclaim epistemic authority. So here I'm connecting epistemic injustice and authority. Um, Basically, it's a call to insist on guiding the way in which autistics and other neuro-minoritized neuro individuals are talked about and represented, as well as to require that we be consulted and taken seriously. So nothing about us without us, in this sense, involves working toward greater epistemic justice, both hermeneutical and testimonial. So let me now turn to the next uh, point in the talk, which is the distinction between perceived versus actual epistemic authority. Now. Um, Epistemic injustice undermines epistemic agency, and it does so by undermining uh, once perceived epistemic authority. Uh, indeed, if you're not adequately believed or not adequately understood, so if you face either testimonial or hermeneutical injustice, this will seriously undermine your ability to produce, use, or transmit knowledge, which is your epistemic agency. Um, and more specifically, it's going to undermine your perceived epistemic authority namely whether you are viewed as qualified to speak on a given topic. So that's a descriptive matter, whether you are actually viewed as such. And that's to be contra contrasted with your actual epistemic authority, which is whether you should be viewed as such because you are actually qualified or adequately positioned to speak on a given topic. So that's a normative matter. Now, about this distinction between perceived and actual epistemic authority, um, the first thing to note is that it's possible to have one without the other. And in a sense, I think that's exactly what the concept of epistemic injustice captures, whether we're thinking about credibility deficits as identified by Fricker, um, where we have uh, people who have actual epistemic authority, but not perceived as such, um, or whether we think of credibility accesses as um, uh, theorized by uh, Medina, where um, the reverse is the case, where uh, someone might be perceived as having um, epistemic authority, but uh, does not actually have it. So an example of this is the gap between uh, first person versus third person accounts of what autism is like. So for example, the presence or lack of social motivation, empathy, or humor. Although autistics are best positioned to describe what autism is like, non-autistic researchers, doctors, parents, or practitioners are often granted more credibility than autistics to talk about autism. So this really reflects this gap between first and third person uh, accounts and in turn um, the, the gap between uh, credibility deficit and excesses. So I think it's important to connect this distinction between perceived and actual epistemic authority to um, the importance of social location for knowledge production uh, that's been articulated in standpoint theory, uh, in particular through three main tenets. Um, so 
uh, standpoint theory tells us that knowledge is socially situated. The idea here is that the position we occupy in the social structure gives us access to a certain part of the world and uh, so a certain experience of the world and so also a certain knowledge of the world. Um, second, there is also an epistemic privilege um, a thesis in standpoint theory whereby um, people who experience oppression firsthand, so marginalized and oppressed groups, um, are more adequately positioned to speak about um, oppression because precisely they experience it firsthand. Um, but thirdly, um, this epistemic privilege is not automatic, so you don't just happen to be epistemically privileged just because you're born into a certain category uh, or you become a member of one. Um, it's not automatic in the sense that it has to be uh, generally collectively mediated and critically generated. So a standpoint is something you achieve, not something that you inherently have in virtue of your social identity. Um, okay, so now um, let's talk about um, the second notion I wanted to introduce, which is the notion of neuronormalized avoidance, uh, more commonly known as neurotypical ignorance. So much as members of non human groups will tend to have an epistemic privilege because the experience of oppression firsthand, as I just said when I was talking about standpoint theory, members of dominant groups will tend to have what Charles Mills calls epistemic ignorance because they do not directly experience oppression. Because the term ignorance has ableist and classist connotations, I instead use the word avoidance to refer to the phenomenon that Mills calls ignorance. So I will use an asterisk to indicate uh, that ignorance is a problematic term, um, but really in what follows, whenever you see ignorance and avoidance, you can assume that uh, they can be used interchangeably if that helps you follow. Um, so the term ignorance refers both to a lack of knowledge as when one is ignorant about say astrophysics, and to a form of denial, refusal, or resistance, as when one person ignores another, or when one ignores a certain type of reality, like climate change or racial injustice, despite readily available and pervasive evidence. The term ignorance can thus connote both a lack and an active kind of attitude or behavior. And similarly, the term avoidance connotes both the lack of facing up to or recognizing the person, situation, or knowledge that one is avoiding, but also the fact that one is actively, though not always consciously and explicitly, seeking to avoid this confrontation or recognition. So for Mills, um, white ignorance is defined as follows quote, um, a particular pattern of localized and global cognitive dysfunctions, which are psychologically and socially functional, producing the ironic outcome that whites will in general be unable to understand the world they themselves have made. And part of what it means to be constructed as white, uh, Mills goes on to say, is a cognitive model that precludes self-transparency and genuine understanding of social realities. So I think what this um, shows is that ignorance or avoidance has both an objective and a subjective component. So let me say a little bit more about this. I think that subjective avoidance is this notion that members of dominant groups experience their privileged position as so natural and normal as uh, for it to become imperceptible or unquestionable. There's just a lack of self-transparency of the subject of knowledge. So here, members of dominant groups. And in the case of autism, I think we can see that in the fact that very few uh, neuronormalized uh, or non-autistic people know the word allistic, which actually refers to non-autistic people. Uh, by contrast, the word autistic is much more well-known. So it's sort of like this uh, position of being allistic is so taken for granted that it's not even worth naming, um, let alone knowing that it, that's what it's called. Um, and objective avoidance, um, as a result of this subjective avoidance, members of dominant groups um, are going to misunderstand, misinterpret, and resist significant aspects of the social world. And this um, in turn will lead to a lack of adequate understanding of the object of knowledge of certain realities, uh, for example, neuronormativity or various myths about autism. So one thing that Mill says, which is very interesting is that just as we might um, speak of white or male um, ignorance, we might also talk about other types of ignorance or avoidance. And so here I wanna suggest that we might want to talk about neuronormalized avoidance um, or neurotypical ignorance. So um, 
when we look at uh, white ignorance, basically it uh, corresponds to a system of oppression that is racism, which creates and is in turn uh, sustained by a set of assumptions, norms, and practices that uh, we might call white supremacy, which in turn produces white ignorance and subjective um, ignorance and objective ignorance um, in both uh, components. So a lack of self-transparency and also a lack of adequate understandings of social realities. And so similarly, in the case of um, neural normalized avoidance um, or neurotypical ignorance, um, the uh, corresponding system of oppression is neuroableism and it uh, creates and is sustained by a set of assumptions, norms, and practices that we might call neuronormativity, which produces neurotypical avoidance, again, both in its subjective and uh, objective components with a lack of self-transparency and a lack of adequate understandings of social realities. So I think this leads us to identify the first criterion for actual epistemic authority, um, which is that you need to have an awareness of both subjective and objective neuronormalized avoidance. So you need to recognize that your social position limits your um, understanding of certain social realities. And I say including for autistics because um, we as autistics are also variously socially positioned and in intersectionality um, positioned in the um, social structure. So um, we also need to be sensitive to the fact that there is various ways of experiencing autism. Um, and so basically for um, the subjective aspect of um, avoidance, uh, we want to be aware of our social positionality and how that is going to come with some epistemic limits, namely um, the objective aspect of avoidance, which um, pushes us to recognize the epistemic trustworthiness of autistics um, because they are more adequately positioned to speak about these realities of autism. Um, and the distinction here between propositional and experiential knowledge in relation to epistemic injustice is going to um, help us make sense of uh, the epistemic trustworthiness of autistics. So let me um, turn now to this dis distinction. So. Um, this uh, distinction basically points to the fact that experiential knowledge includes, for example, um, tacit, embodied, and effective knowing, um, and uh, it's to be contrasted with uh, propositional knowledge. So here we might take an example to illustrate experiential knowledge with uh, the case of anxiety. So you might have propositional knowledge about social anxiety, but without ever experiencing it. By contrast, you might have experiential knowledge of a social anxiety because of what um, you experience and know through your body and affects. Um, moreover, social anxiety might be triggered by one's tacit knowledge that a particular social context is not friendly to or welcoming of people in your intersectional position, for example, as an autistic woman or an autistic BIPOC trans or non-binary person. Um, so here you can see the different aspects of um, embodied, effective, and uh, tacit knowledge um, that are crucial to the experiential um, knowledge component of autism. Note that our propositional knowledge of what social anxiety is or feels like will be more complete, accurate, and reliable if it's informed by the perspectives of people who experience social anxiety firsthand and um, um, who therefore have experiential um, knowledge of social anxiety. Now, applied to propositional knowledge about autism, the idea is that before talking about or for autistics, allistics should consult and listen to first personal testimonies from autistics who can offer a critical and diverse perspective. I say critical in relation to the standpoint idea that we saw earlier that basically, um, uh, basically achieving a standpoint or epistemic privilege um, it takes a critical stance that's uh, typically um, collectively mediated. Um, and I see a diverse pers perspective uh, once again because of intersectionality, which means that autism can also um, include uh, various other intersections like nonverbal autism, gender identification, sexual orientation, race, class, education, physical and intellectual disability, age, culture, indigeneity, national origin, and immigration status, all of which are going to um, influence and affect your experience of autism in everyday settings. So I think that leads us to the second criterion for actual epistemic authority, um, which is a propositional knowledge that's inclusive of, um, we want to have propositional knowledge that's inclusive of and informed by first personal experiential knowledge from autistic people. Um, and again, with the emphasis on uh, 
autistic people who have critical and diverse perspectives. So let me now turn to uh, the very last point, which is getting us close to the end here. Um, Basically, I've argued that uh, legitimate or actual epistemic authority on autism depends on two criteria. First, the awareness of both objective and subjective neuronormalized avoidance. And second, the reliance on experiential, critical, and diverse knowledge. And I think these two criteria require the revision of one's previous beliefs when they turn out to be false in the face of counter evidence. I think this approach fosters greater epistemic justice for autistics. It takes them seriously as epistemic agents, both as relevant interlocutors, which fosters testimonial justice, and as contributors to mainstream interpretive resources, such as social representations and understandings of autism, which foster greater hermeneutical justice. And to conclude, I think that this um, shows us that epistemic authority should be viewed as a process rather than an outcome. I think that's one of the key points from my chapter. Um, epistemic authority should not be construed as a one-off outcome that can easily be checked off or that once achieved is permanently secured and retained. Rather, legitimate or actual epistemic authority should be viewed and approached as a process, something that must be continually practiced, repeated, updated, and developed. As a process, epistemic authority is a way to consistently approach how one produces and validates knowledge, namely in a careful, epistemically humble way. So it's a form of accountability in the production of knowledge. And so rather than being in conflict, I think that epistemic humility and epistemic authority are compatible, and indeed that epistemic humility may be required for epistemic authority. And these are my references. I'm happy to send them um, to anybody who would like them. And I'm going to stop sharing so we can uh, turn to discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, so uh, like I said, I can remind presenters that uh, presenters can't use the Q&A. So if you want to ask a question, now you'll have to raise your hand. Let's see if we're getting any questions here. There's no questions in the Q&A, but uh, Jonathan has his hand up. So if you want to go ahead, Jonathan. Thank you, uh, Nathan. Th thank you, Amadine. That was really a fabulous talk. And I, I think um, one of the reasons there are no questions so far is that it's so convincing and so compelling that uh, it, it, it was it's very hard for me to think um, that people listening carefully to your talk are going to disagree with very much. But what, what I wondered is, is whether, so I hadn't um, heard the contrast name to autistic. So uh, allistic, did, did you say? Um, so what I wondered really about, about epistemic authority is that um, there are some interesting things being said about holistic people by autistic scholars. So there's, there's a type of sort of third party authority in, in that it's actually in some cases quite hard to get that yeah, understanding of yourself. So, so I wondered whether, um, I, I, I presume you would agree that uh, epistemic authority and first person authority don't always have to go uh, together. Um, and that you know, those on an outside, an outsider's perspective in some cases can be a very helpful one. So um, I, I don't think that contradicts anything you say, but, uh, I'd be interested in your reaction to it. Yeah, thank you so much for that comment and question, uh, Jonathan. So um, yes, I mean to get to your to your main point at the end, I think absolutely first person um, perspectives are not necessarily uh, conducive to epistemic authority on my account, since, like I said, it would really need to be. Um, uh, approach from a critical and diverse perspective, which a lot of autistics don't necessarily are. We're humans and socially positioned as everybody else. And so we also have epistemic limits that attach to our particular um, uh, social position. Um, I think 
maybe I just want to add the, the, the point about Allistic was actually introduced by autistics uh, initially as a bit of a, like a satire because uh, we're always referred to as um, uh, uh, autistics as like, you know, turn to uh, auto, so turn to toward the self. And so uh, Allistic obviously is this idea of being turned toward others. And um, it has, of course, there's like all of these jokes about, you know, neurotypical syndrome and like people who can't uh, live without the opinion of others and the presence of others and like all these funny things. Anyway, it's really quite funny. Um, but um, but yes, I mean, I do think that it had, so it was in, initially intended as a sort of a joke, but it actually stuck as like a, a term to um, refer to non-autistic people. And I do think that it's actually quite valuable to have a, a name for that position. Um, and, and also maybe one that incidentally is based on uh, 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 autistic humor, um, just to prove the point. <laughs> so um, I thought uh, I thought I would just add this little fun fact. That's a very autistic thing to do. Um, and um, if I've missed anything in your comment or question, please do feel free to come back. But that's what I would want to say for now. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from the set um, who asks, says, uh, thanks for the great talk. Do you have any thoughts about how the concept of theory of mind contributes to epistemic injustice? I'm thinking that it's not just holistics that are uh, not just that holistics think autistics lack theory of mind when in fact autistics do have it, but that the concept of theory of mind itself is problematic. Yep, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that question. Um... Yeah. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. So I I actually have a part of my chapter where I talk exactly about that problem. The chapter is much longer than what I could fit into this presentation. Um, so I went sort of straight to the criteria, but I talk a lot about theory of mind. Um, so this idea that autistics are supposed to be um, unable to read other people's um, sort of, yeah, minds or intentions or whatever, like basically to adopt the perspective of other people. Um, and sometimes it's also... Um, uh, turned into a claim against autistics having access to their own interior states and understanding their own selves. And so in that sense, it really does undermine uh, this idea that we should turn to autistics for um, their personal um, uh, experience and their personal accounts of what autism is, because they won't know anyway, because they have no idea. They can't really articulate that to themselves anyway. They're sort of almost alien to themselves as well as to others. Um, so yes, that would definitely undermine uh, both testimonial injustice in the sense that it basically undermines your credibility, your epistemic authority on your own experience. But I think it also undermines hermeneutical um, justice because um, it basically perpetuates theory of mind or, or Tom um, perpetuates this representation of autistics that's been uh, proven to be false um, and uh, but that unfortunately is really sticking around um, and um, so that's that's I think uh, what what I what I would want to say um, and I just thought of something that maybe I can um, add uh, both to Jonathan's question but I think is also um, uh, relevant to um, uh, to this question although it has actually just literally escaped my mind um, oh this idea that there can be um, internalized neuroableism. So I think that that's another reason why we don't necessarily want to claim that a first person account by an autistic, uh, if they have um, internalized uh, neuroableism, uh, which I mean, I can attest to the fact that none of us are immune to this, uh, even when we're working on these issues and teaching about them and, and, and all that. Um, it, and so I think it really does take effort to, um, to basically um, reintegrate your autistic self in a sense and not um, be sort of um, alienated by these um, self-conceptions that are actually uh, imposed from the outside, uh, including, it could be Tom, but it could be so many other things. And that's why I wanted to make the, the, the connection between his question and Jonathan's comment before about first person uh, epistemic uh, authority. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have a question from Jane. Uh, says, uh, thanks very much for that, Amandine. Uh, I really like this project. I'd like to hear more about critical epistemic authority and how it might be distinctive in the case of autism, which at this point has a long activist self-advocate history and history of organizing. In cases of forms of neurodivergence with different histories and less cohesive activist histories, what are good ways for developing that kind of critical standpoint for folks who have first-person lived experience and or for figuring out who or what to listen to for folks who don't. Hope this question makes sense. If not, happy to chat uh, about it later. 
Great. Thank you so much, Jane, um, for the question and, and for being here. Um, let me see. Um, so it sounds like maybe you're uh, drawing a contrast between um, yeah, yeah, I see autism has a longer history of, of activism and self-advocacy. That's that's true. Um, but, you know, I, I would say, I, I think that even within the autism movement, there's still a lot to learn. I mean, I think that, um, so sorry, I'm going to start with maybe a slight tangent, but but it, it, it's just to say, because I don't want to take it for granted that sort of it's been around for longer. And so we sort of have it figured out. And I'm not I know that that's not what you're suge suggesting. And your question is is elsewhere. Uh, your point is something else. But I do want to flag that in passing as I answer your question. Um, that I think, and precisely, this is also why I was trying to really emphasize the critical perspective and the, the diverse perspective is that um, we really need to recognize just how widely different uh, experiencing autism is going to be based on these very um, different axes of um, intersectionality that I was mentioning. Um, and I mean, I think in particular, there's uh, still a lack of um, 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 centering BIPOC perspectives. We have BIPOC perspectives within autism. They're just not necessarily always centered. Um, and so I think that that's, that's, that's important. Um, and uh, same thing with nonverbal autism, which I think to this day remains utterly misunderstood, uh, mistaken for um, uh, intellectual disability, people who are unable to uh, communicate or express themselves and things like that, which is not necessarily true. And I think um, really, really, uh, um, um, uh, significantly uh, problematic as a misunderstanding. Um, so I think, let's see, um, I, I think maybe I will just repeat that, like if if for your question about how to um, basically, uh, this I feel a bit uncomfortable sort of uh, dictating how to start a, a, like a movement, but, um, or, or, you know, like what are the desiderat of maybe that's a bit what I'm doing in the talk, but I, I suppose I, I, I want to say like, um, yeah, like I said, I, I really do think, um, recognizes recognizing that epistemic authority is a, always a process and including i think f for 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 the people ourselves at the core of the movement making sure that we're integrating everybody and that we're um recognizing our own uh, epistemic limitations um so yeah i would say i would just reiterate i'm sorry i think at this point this is where my thinking is at but i'm i'm totally happy to chat about it more later like you were saying but i think that that's what i would want to say i think once again just um re recognizing our own um uh, subjective and, and objective avoidance and then um the um 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 the um the, the 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 sort of adopting um, a critical and diverse perspectives, and I, I see there's something in the in the in the chat. Um, so um, yeah, okay, good. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad that was helpful. Thank you. Yes, yes. Epistemic authority is always a process. Yes, absolutely. That's really like a like I was um, uh, saying. I think in the in the chapter comes out a lot more clearly because I can spend a little bit more time on it. But that's one of the key points that I want to make in this uh, on this topic is exactly that that epistemic authority is always a process. So thank you. I don't see any other questions right now, and uh, I agree with Jonathan. And it's I'm just you know found myself nodding along with talk, you know, like agreeing with uh, everything that you were saying. Um, uh, but I guess I could ask if um like if if you have thought about uh, whether the, the like the practical implications of um like uh, uh, like for say like you've got um you've developed the concept of meta epistemic injustice, so like injustice that occurs at the level of writing about epistemic injustice. Um, so I'm wondering if you've thought about um, uh, what this, um, what the ideas you've talked about here, uh, what they imply for how we should go about writing on epistemic injustice in philosophy. Yeah, thank you so much, Nathan. That's a, that's a great question and uh, and uh, very thoughtful because it appeals to a concept I actually use in the chapter, but not in this um, in this uh, in this presentation. So thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, so in other work. Um, in my 2020 uh, 
paper whose reference is in the in the chat. Um, I talk about this concept of meta um, epistemic injustice, which I define as an injustice that arises at the level of philosophical methodology when we are, it's an epistemic injustice about epistemic injustice. So it's an epistemic injustice that philosophers sort of uh, methodologically commit when they are formulating their theories and, and accounts of epistemic agency. So what counts um, as knowledge, what counts as an epistemic agent, what are the criteria for legitimate credibility, intelligibility, authority, all of those things. And I think you're absolutely right, Nathan, that this uh, um, this um, presentation has implications for that in the sense that basically whenever, uh, for example, we were talking about uh, theory of mind earlier, um, which uh, would undermine, so if you adopt theory of mind, that's a sort of meta epistemic injustice, because you're basically saying um, that some people do not uh, count as uh, epistemic agents, because presumably they like, so autistics presumably lack theory of mind, so that would be a problem. Um, and uh, similarly, with this idea of, um, and this, by the way, um, I didn't specify this when I mentioned this point, but this idea that um, it's it's okay not to trust someone uh, if they don't look you in the eye or if they appear anxious or nervous. These are points that are made by philosophers who work on issues of epistemic injustice and issues of um, you know social uh, uh, injustice more generally. So I think that it's interesting to see that we tend to take these things for granted. It's a little bit sometimes like neurodiversity is like this last frontier where it's sort of like we're still used as like these counter examples to, to you know, or like, or clearly if you're not looking someone in the eye which again i really also want to point out like the 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 significance of cultural intersectionality here. So there's obviously, we know like in certain um, Asian cultures, looking people in the eye is actually a sign of disrespect. And it, the same is true in certain indigenous communities. Um, and so not looking people in the eye sometimes can actually be a, a sign of um, a, a respect of more than anything. And, and so it's very interesting how these things can get very misinterpreted. But that's um, all of these sort of clues or, or um, uh, criteria that would be used against um, recognizing someone's epistemic agency, I think, um, um, are our case of uh, meta epistemic uh, injustice. Thank you again. Okay, um, thanks for that answer. Um, very uh, informative. Uh, so we have another question from Owen. And uh, he asks, uh, can you give any examples of why there are ways that autistics are beginning to take serious, are beginning to be taken seriously as epistemic agents? within more dominant discourses, research, et cetera, on autism. And can you speak to the role of community-based participatory research orgs such as ASFIRE? Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I think that, yes, it's true. Uh, some um, autistic people with certain autistic profiles are, are starting to be um, uh, taken more seriously. I, I do think that these profiles remain overwhelmingly um, white, sometimes male, um, um, and especially verbal. Um, I think there's a really big lack of uh, racial and nonverbal uh, diversity, which once again, I think is really problematic because um, there's a lot that um, uh, not only racialized, but also nonverbal people can uh, communicate about autism and how we should understand it. Um, and um, uh, so I have actually a lot to say about community-based participatory research. Um, uh, but uh, just because, I, yeah, I mean, or this idea of of including um, uh, autistics in um, in research and other ways, I think this again needs to be done really um, in very careful ways. I, I I'm a little bit. Um, um, skeptical of, uh, I feel like it, you know, it's a bit like EDI, equity, diversity, inclusion. It's sort of like, it. sometimes it's like ticking a box. Like we had, and you see that, well, you always have like the same, um, I don't know exactly if this is what you mean, but this is what your question inspires in my, in my understanding of it. So um, that, that, um, basically, yes, you, you will hold oh, in a certain context, you always have like the same autistic person who's sort of like the autistic token on the, and, and, you know, uh, depending it may be more or less vocal in advocating for their cause but it's just there it's clearly sitting there to check a box um to say yes we had an autistic person on the board or on the panel or whatever uh, but usually the, um, these people are not actually actually uh, sorry actively involved in producing um the 
basically conceiving, like like designing the actual um, study? Is it even a study that is wanted by the artistic community? Is it even a, a, a question that the uh, artistic community considers worth addressing. I mean, I think that one very big problem in research on autism or with autistics um, is this obsession with uh, mapping the autistic genome, which, as I said, um, you know, is is uh, uh, really really tainted with uh, undertones of curing autism and prenatal testing um, to avoid um, an, an abort. Um, autistic fetuses and things like that. So um, I think like, you know, if we were to uh, redirect the literally hundreds of millions of dollars that are spent each year on genetic research toward addressing the actual needs of the autistic community and, and maybe also sometimes um, support needs for for uh, for families of, of autistic children, um, I think we would go a much longer way uh, toward helping the autistic community than mapping this um, genome, so to speak, which also seems to be a bit of a, a the quest for the holy grail in the sense of like, it, it, I, I don't even know that that's technically um, possible. As far as I understand, it's a lot more complex than what we think it is. Um, so anyway, I will stop here, but thank you, Owen. And sorry if I didn't address completely, but that's what, those were my, my rambling thoughts. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Emily. Now says, uh, hi, Amandine, fabulous talk. Uh, just an invitation to say more about the shift from using the terms neurodivergent and neurotypical to neurominoritized and neuronormalized. I find the shift very interesting and would love to hear uh, more about the critical potential of these terms. Yeah, so um, in another project, actually, I talk, which is not the chapter for the guide, but but um, I talk about this a little in, in a bit more length. Um, so I think clearly this idea of neurotypical, neuroatypical is still um, sort of is misleading in the sense that it really um, sort of, it still takes problematically, I think, some sort of profile as the norm. And that profile is is uh, dubbed the neurotypical profile. And then from that, you get like all of these um, neuroatypical profiles. But I think that if you if you take the neurodiversity uh, conception, not just the movement, because you know neurodiversity refers both to a social movement, the nothing about us without us, and all that stuff. Um, but it it's this the social movement is based on the key premise of recognizing neurodiversity as a sort of you know sort of. Um, biological um, uh, phenomenon, just, just like biodiversity, you have neurodiversity and it's it's present everywhere around the globe and it's uh, across all of, like I said, different axes of uh, intersectionality. So if you take neurodiversity, the, this just the fact that the, the humanity is made up of a just, you know, whole range of natural variations across the, the range of um, neurocognitive profiles, um, then it doesn't make any sense to talk about typical versus is uh, atypical. So I always like to use the example um, of eye color. So, um, you know, if you uh, take for granted that, um, you know, it, in the variety, naturally occurring variety of eye colors, um, in fact, uh, brown eyes are much more prevalent than blue eyes. Um, you know, you take that and we call them brown eyes and blue eyes. We don't say that blue eyed people are chromo atypical because they are deviating from the brown eyed norm, which is much more prevalent. So what I'm trying to say here is that basically it doesn't have anything to do with what's typical in terms of statistics or atypical in terms of statistics. I think that misses the point. What I'm trying to say is that basically we take for granted, we, we recognize that um, we have neurodiversity as by biodiversity as you know racial diversity whatever we want to like ethnic and other sort of diversities um and once we say that it makes no sense to start referring to uh, certain um uh, people as typical atypical or by the way as people always say as certain people as neurodiverse neurodiversity is not an individual attribute neurodiversity is 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 an attribute of a community <laughs> like of humanity is neurodiverse but one person is never going to be neurodiverse that's like saying that you know a black person is 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 racially diverse that makes zero sense humanity is racially diverse um it's the same thing with neurodiversity which again i'm sorry i'm just getting this is like totally my you know special interest here so i'm just like really getting into it uh, but uh, you know um 
the 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 yeah just this 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 idea that we need a euphemism such as neurodiverse uh to refer to autism because autism is just way too scary a word and way too stigmatizing when there is absolutely nothing technically stigmatizing about identifying a particular type of profile as autistic and the fact that people want to use the term neurodiverse i think says a long it says a lot about um how autism is perceived it's you know it's like when people say oh you're not disabled you're differently able and like all these sorts of like you know uh rhetoric uh, rhetorical gymnastics it's just like you're literally bending over backwards to like you know avoid a term that you just it's like dirty to you or something and it's just just, just really highly problematic um so really the idea here like i i was saying uh, uh, using neuro minoritized using neuro normalized is this idea of recognizing that we have natural variations and some of them become minoritized and others become normalized and that's what I meant and that this this idea of like basically social political power relations that become grafted onto these categories and that produce them as um um yeah uh neuro minoritized and neuro normalized but I think we I really really want to highlight just I think the the danger both descriptively and normatively um of, of speaking in terms of neurotypical and neurotypical like I understand that it's taken to be like respective and descriptive but it actually is problematic because it continues this myth that um there is such a thing as a norm and the norm th there is no norm uh the norm is neurodiversity and if you say that then it loses all meaning to talk about um typical and atypical um anyway just think of the blue eyes like if we don't refer to people um who have blue eyes as a chromo atypical um anyway thank you hey we're out of time for questions uh so would uh join me in uh thanking our speaker uh thanks everyone for your questions and nathan again for sharing and great great questions and discussion i appreciate it so much feel free to be in touch for um slides references further conversation anything i'll be happy to respond thanks again yeah, it was a wonderful talk and it gave me a lot to quite a, quite a bit about. Thanks so much, Nathan. And Amadine, as I said before, a really wonderful talk and much looking forward to seeing this in print. And um, it is definitely a collection that will deserve to be reviewed in the top journals. Um, whether it does or not is a matter we'll have to see later on.